Welcome to Mr. Pollock Biology. This is a series on biochemistry and the first video is about proteins or polypeptides. This is for AS level unit 1, the AQA specification, so that's the unit called biology and disease. Here's our objectives. You're going to know the structure of an amino acid. You're going to understand the reactions that those amino acids can undergo. You're going to describe the levels of polypeptide structure or protein structure and you're going to describe the biochemical test that we use to identify protein. Let's get started by looking at the structure of an amino acid, which starts off with a nitrogen-carbon-carbon backbone. Now, bound to the nitrogen on the left-hand side in this diagram, we have two hydrogen atoms. Now, if we move across to the right-hand side of this molecule, we have a double bound oxygen and a hydroxyl group, so C double bond O, OH. In the centre we have a lone hydrogen atom that's always there and a variable group called the R group, which we'll talk about in a second. So the left hand side here is the amino group, that's the NH2 group, and the right hand side here is the C double bond O, OH group or the carboxylic acid group. We've also got the R group which can change depending on which of the naturally occurring amino acids we're looking at. Now the examiner will ask you to identify these key groups but they won't always be in, this, in the places that we see here. So for example the amino group might be on the right, the R group might be on the bottom, the whole molecule might be rotated through 90 degrees, so just be aware you need to know what you're looking for. So the amine, amino group sorry, is NH2, the carboxylic acid group is COOH, and the R group is whatever, whatever is opposite the lone hydrogen on the central carbon. So for example, if we get rid of that, the R group can change. So in the case of alanine, we have CH3. In the case of what's next? In the case of serine, we have a methanol group, CH2OH. And in the case of glycine, we have a hydrogen. So this R group is the only variable region. Now, some of those R groups contain sulfur, um, which we'll see the importance of later. But for the most part, all proteins contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. If you see nitrogen in a molecule, chances are it's a protein. So let's look at the reactions. So as with any biological molecule, when we polymerize, it's a condensation reaction. When we break that polymer down, it's a hydrolysis. So two amino acids together will form a dipeptide and a molecule of water. And then we can do the, re the reverse of that reaction, a hydrolysis, to form two amino acids from a dipeptide and water. So let's look at how this, how this occurs. So for condensation, we start off with two adjacent amino acids and we remove water and that involves the formation of a dipeptide, a peptide bond and one molecule of water. So the reverse of that would be a hydrolysis. So we start off with one molecule of water and a dipeptide. We break those bonds to form our two amino acids. Nice and straightforward. Next up we should look at polypeptide structure. So there are four main levels. The primary structure, the first level, is the specific sequence amino acids in the polypeptide chain. Now this is really important because um, the primary structure will define all the subsequent levels of protein structure. And if one amino acid is out of, out of sequence in the wrong place, then the whole chain will fold up in the wrong way later on. The bonds that are present at this level are the peptide bonds that occur between each of the amino acids. Note that if we have, say, five amino acids forming a pentapeptide, then we will get the number of amino acids minus one 
number of water molecules produced. So we get 4. So n minus 1, 5 minus 1 is 4 to get the number of water molecules produced. So in this picture here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37 amino acids. So this condensation will produce 36 water molecules when the peptide bonds are formed. Moving on to the secondary structure. The secondary structure is the way that the primary structure folds and it can form two major structures. It can form alpha helices, which are like corkscrews, or beta pleated sheets, which are like kinky bits. And these are held in place by weak forces of attraction called hydrogen bonds. These are very weak and can be broken easily when we think about what happens at the tertiary level of protein structure. So secondary structure is the folding of primary structure into either alpha helices, they're a corkscrew, or beta pleats, and hydrogen bonds are the bonds that are present here. We move on to tertiary structure where things get a bit 3D. So this is the specific 3D shape formed due to the attractions between the R groups of the primary structure. So there's that primary structure, the importance there um, coming into its own. So the R groups will attract one another in very specific ways and that will determine the 3D shape that's formed. And we can get hydrogen bonds here, we can get ionic bonds, or we can get very strong covalent bonds. Ionic bonds form between charged R groups, covalent bonds form between sulfur containing R groups. So if you've got sulfur in your R group, you can form these things called disulfide bridges, which are incredibly strong. Now, most other bonds will be broken by the effects of heating on, uh, on the peptide structure, but covalent bonds are incredibly strong and will remain intact. And this has popped up on exam questions before, so keep that in mind. If there's a sulfur present, they can form strong covalent bonds. Now the first three levels of protein structure, or polypeptide structure, are present in every single protein. The next two that I'd like to talk about aren't. So quaternary structure is present not in all proteins, but in some. And this is where more than one polypeptide chain is associated together. So they're not part of the same chain, but they're strongly attracted to one another. So that's quaternary structure. The next level is called, or rather are called, prostatic groups. And this is where we get stuff that isn't a polypeptide incorporated into the structure. And the best example of this is on the right here, and this is hemoglobin. And hemoglobin exhibits both quaternary structure and prostatic groups. So we can see that there are two different coloured polypeptides here. In fact, there are four different, or four subunits in total, so two blue ones and two red ones. And there are four different polypeptide chains. There's our quaternary structure. Different polypeptide chains associated together. As for prosthetic groups, well, if we look carefully in each of those subunits, we see we've got another, um, another structure kicking around. And this is an iron ion, an Fe2 plus group. So this is a non-polypeptide, but it's part of the structure. And that's what, that's what gives hemoglobin its oxygen carrying ability. But we'll look at that in another video. Finally, we look at the biochemical test for polypeptides. This is the biorect test. So the first stage is to add the biorect reagent to your sample. Uh, in some cases, you might not have biorect reagent, and you can use copper sulfate, Cu2, CuSO4, um, and a weak base, such as potassium hydroxide. The same thing. So you can add the biorect reagent to your sample, and you're looking for a color change from blue to lilac or mauve. And if you get that lilac or mauve colour, that indicates the presence of peptide bonds and therefore you're looking at a protein being present.